Quick disclaimer. The Airway Circle Radio podcast has been produced for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. All of the content, views, and opinions shared by our hosts and guests should not be a substitute for medical advice. Please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to the Airway Answers podcast, expanding your breadth of knowledge. Our wonderful host is Nicole Goldfarb. Nicole is a speech-language pathologist, certified orofacial myologist, and an international speaker. Nicole is the owner of San Diego Center for Speech Therapy and Myofunctional Therapy. She has a special passion and interest in sleep disorder breathing and diagnosing restricted freedoms as they relate to myofunctional disorders. In the Airway Answers podcast, Nicole will be interviewing specialists in the Airway Realm in order to help our listeners learn and understand all of the components to airway-focused treatment. You can help us by sharing this podcast episode with your friends and colleagues. Enjoy the show. I have some amazing superstars here this afternoon, and I think it's actually the morning in Australia, right, Dr. McIntosh? So I'm going to do a little introduction, and we will get started. I have Dr. Bill Harrell, Dr. David McIntosh, and Dr. David Gazal, and we're going to be talking about a medical textbook that will be coming. They are the three editors of this book, and the book will be published in this coming year, 2024. Dr. Harrell is an orthodontist in Alexander City, Alabama, and he specializes in a bunch of different orthodontic treatments, but specifically airway orthodontics, and that's his passion. He's devoted most of his career to educating his peers, the public, and other healthcare professionals on the importance of discovering and treating airway obstructions leading to altered growth issues in children that can cause serious health conditions later in life, which directly reflects the book that he has founded and created. So we will talk about that. We also have Dr. David McIntosh, who is a pediatric ENT specialist in Australia. And the great thing here is Dr. McIntosh's specific area of focus is in the airway realm. So a lot of us always say we refer to uh, ENTs and They don't understand the airway impact. And Dr. McIntosh always stresses that ENTs have different trainings and areas of focus. So his area of focus has to do with airway, breathing, sleep disordered breathing. He's the author of the book Snored to Death and other books you could mention as well. And he has particular interest in airway obstruction facial and dental development and its relationship to ENT and airway problems and also middle ear disease. He also specializes in sinus disease and provides opinions on the benefit of revision of previous sinus operations. And we also have the wonderful Dr. David Gazal here. We've got two Davids with us today. And you probably recently heard Dr. David Gazal on Airway Circle as well with a wonderful presentation microbiome, life-changing presentation. If you have not seen that, everybody, I recommend you watch that. Dr. David Gazal is a vice president of health affairs and the dean at John C. Edwards School of Medicine. Dr. Gazal began his tenure as vice president for the health affairs at Marshall University and the sixth dean of the Marshall University School of Medicine just in July of this year, 2023. He's a pediatric pulmonologist and world-renowned pediatric sleep expert. So a lot of the research that we're all reading about is founded by Dr. Gazal. So we appreciate all of your dedication to advancing this field. Currently, Dr. Gazal served in positions at Tulane University, University of Louisville, University of Chicago, among others. He's the recipient of dozens of honors, awards, and recognitions for his work. And Dr. Gazal has been federally funded the NIH of Health Researcher since 1992. So we are here with three superstars. I feel it. What we want to talk about today is the medical textbook titled Growing into Breathing Problems, The Quest for Collaborative Lifetime Solutions. And Dr. Harold McIntosh and Gazal are the three editors on this textbook. So I just want to start out by talking about or asking, where did this textbook come from? Where did this idea come from? And I think I'm going to need to direct that to you, Dr. Harold. It is. I've been kind of interested in airway, I guess, you know, after I got out of ortho school, we were practicing the way we normally get out. And then about the 80s, I guess, is when some of the the monkey studies started, Linda Aronson started doing some work on children. 
tonsil adenoid problems and issues. Jim McNamara, who was the chairman of orthodontics at Michigan, started doing a lot of work about airway. Of course, Bob Ricketts, who was an orthodontist in California, I can remember us studying him back in the 70s and thinking he was just way off the wall talking about airway and nutrition, about all this stuff. But that's kind of where my aha moments, I guess, started. And then I guess it's interesting how this developed. David McIntosh and I, kind of a weird way we got to each other. I was following him on Facebook and through some of his airway focused. And he and I got to actually talking a little bit more in detail about some things. And I was telling him about this book that I've been wanting to write for a long time. His interest came on and I went, well, here's an ENT that understands airway and understands how dentistry and specifically orthodontics relates to all this stuff. And that was kind of one of the things I was trying to find. And then David Gazal and I, I guess you've already given all his credentials. And that's why I focused on him because I said, who else would I rather have? And we talked a lot, and I guess I kind of got his attention a little bit about what I was trying to do. I'm going to tell you, Nicole, if you do not pay attention to Bill, he will make you pay attention to him. <laughs> Let me tell a few funny stories, okay? Yeah. So we are jointly at this conference many years ago, and I think I was giving the lecture, but actually before I was giving the lecture, I was sitting just in front of him. And somebody knocks on my back. Says, Hi, I'm Bill. I'm from Alabama. And boy, you and I need to talk. <laughs> we talked and we talked about the airway. Guess what? The airway, of course. And what he said was, it's time for us in all the medical fields, in all the healthcare professions to talk together, not to each of us go in the separate direction. And that was exactly what I was trying to propose, not only by coming to conferences of dentists, orthodontists, healthcare professionals, and not just physicians, but try to bring everybody together because it was obvious that each of us needs to play a very important role. And if we all talk together and communicate that Bill will be happy and David McIntosh will be happy and more importantly, the kids will be happy and they will be happy now and they will be happy forever. And that was really the whole purpose of the conversation. Yep. And over the years, we kept running into each other. And then he said, you know, I haven't forgotten about the book. <laughs> and I thought he was going to talk to me about the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's in the Bible belt. And I said, God is going to come and tell us about the book. But no, he meant that we needed to work together. And so he organized this conference call with David McIntosh, who was very, very wonderful. And we brainstormed for quite a long time and said, you know, let's put this and let's put this and let's put this. And it was amazing because at no time, and this was really the miracle that happened, at no time did we argue about anything being included was exactly the opposite. All of us thought that any suggestion that was coming in was actually most welcome and needed to be incorporated into the book. And that, I think, led to inviting all the authors and continuously, Bill has got this very compelling way of inviting everybody and making them convert. <laughs> and essentially, you know, it's kind of Oh, well, I don't know if it's going to work. Well, I always said so that it was going to work. That's what the authors today say. So God bless him. He really deserves the credit for everything that is happening. And both the two Davids are, let me put it this way, real followers of Bill in this leadership effort. Well, yeah. thank you, Bill. Thank for, you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I mean, way to put this together, Dr. Harold, because that is a perfect segue to what is the book about? What are the chapters? Can you list all this? Because I know there are a lot of different authors, and this book is probably one of the most comprehensive sleep airway textbooks that I know of. So can you give us some information? Yeah, David McIntosh may want to kind of chime in a little bit just of how we kind of reiterate how we met and what, because <laughs> we talked a lot about some things too. You want to say anything, David? Well, I think the other David has highlighted, Bill, you have an incredible knack for tracking people down and 
bring them into your fold of circles of things and the book is definitely going to be a reflection of that being the case. But for you and me, well, like you said, you tracked me down on Facebook and you said, hey, I'm an orthodontist. And whenever I get those messages, the majority of them are, what the hell are you talking about? And you need to get off your high horse and you're not dentally trained and you don't know what you're talking about. That's my usual routine. You were a breath of fresh air, no pun intended, because you're like, hey, we need to be working together. We need to be doing stuff together. And within a very short period of time, you and I did a live Facebook and YouTube feed, which is still up online to this day, it goes, and we didn't plan it in any way, shape, or form other than, hey, I'm going to talk about orthodontics, you can talk about airway, and we went for like over an hour with no effort, no feeling that we were dragging things out, and we could have kept going, but the things that we were talking about, it's all very much the same thing as David Gazal has said. We all need to be working together. I can give you a perfect example that's contemporary. This big-time podcast called the Huberman Podcast by a guy out of Stanford, and they were talking about autism. The two things that they talked about with autism was the change in a body hormone called vasopressin and the change in the gut microbiome. They mentioned, I think, in passing sleep. Now, they just mentioned that these kids can have sleep problems. But what I've written to Andrew Huberman about, I'm really desperate to try to get his attention, is about kids, is that these kids with sleep-disordered breathing start demonstrating autistic traits. These kids with sleep-disordered breathing get low vasopressin. These kids with sleep-disordered breathing I get altered gut microbiome. I mean, we are working in silos, and the fact that Bill has brought together this enormous diversity of knowledge, skills, and experience and being one of the editors and seeing what they're saying and how they're writing, we are all tripping over each other in terms of saying the same thing. We've got a huge cohort of people that collectively, in inverted commas, get it. They get the fact that we need to be working as a team. We need to, as the book says, collaborating. And as David said, we need to get these kids better. This is all about the kids. This is not about egos. This is not about trying to grandstand ourselves you know we're just sort of just humble little people doing things and let's be honest david gazelle is the most amazing in the accomplishment thing so we'll pat you on the back there david no point being shy about the truth here i'm just some guy in australia bill's just some guy in alabama but we've got things going on as a group that we genuinely want to change the world because parents and clinicians really need to know about this condition because there are way too many kids that are getting misdiagnosed and they're just missing out on their full potential. And that's just not fair. Mm -hmm. Absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. The world needs to know. As you talk about the book and what the chapters are about, also let us know who the audience is going to be for this book. Is it going to be pediatricians or is it going to be staying within our field? So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, the idea behind this was exactly what David and David have talked about is this interdisciplinary. That was kind of my, been my goal is we got to get together. <laughs> the medical guys are out there on their island and everybody's kind of doing their own things and say so it includes allied healthcare professionals too. It includes speech pathologists and or myofunctional therapy and surgeons and the whole bit. So to give you a kind of an idea of how the book's going to be laid out. We're going to do a dedication to Dr. Christian Gimeno because he's the guy that kind of started all this stuff, discovered it in adults, and then in 1976, of course, discovered it in children. So I think that's one of our things. Another thing I'm going to have kind of unique, I guess, to the book is we're going to have each author do their own aha moment, okay? Because a lot of these aha moments come in of, okay, they have a personal Either their father or their mother or their child or themselves have had some awakening, (laughs) so to speak, to turn their brain on to this whole thing about airway. One reason I wanted to do that with everybody is whoever reads the book, I want them to, maybe they've already had an aha moment or maybe they're waiting to get theirs. (laughs) That's kind of what I wanted that to stimulate that, so to speak. Basically, the way the book's going to be laid out, the audience is really healthcare professionals, dentists, 
oil surgeons, orthodontists, anything in that field, medical, whether it be pediatrics or sleep or pulmonology, all the medical fields that would be tied into anything about airway. And then the allied healthcare professionals, the sleep language pathologists, or my functional therapist, and those that are all tied into it. One of the chapters I'm going to write is the basics of malocclusion, because most physicians and other allied healthcare professionals don't really understand how we as orthodox classify things, classify craniofacial growth, and then the way the teeth fit. We're going to kind of do a little quick, just a simple, but most dentists are going to understand it. We'll start out with some screening things. And Jerry Simmons, who's triple, everybody knows him. He's been on here before. He's a neurologist and sleep physician and epilepsy, triple board certified. He's going to do a lot on the esophageal pressure manometry, where he, I think he did it on you, Nicole, where they actually run the tube down your nose and look at the pressure to diagnose upper airway resistance syndrome. To me, that's the important part of where it all starts in kids. We start talking about sleep apnea, but they may not have frank sleep apnea yet. They got upper airway resistance. The unfortunate part of that, it's not recognized. And for most insurance companies, it's not even on the radar, which is crazy because it's like, well, I got a little heart attack going on. I got a little heart issue. And we're just going to ignore it until it gets worse, <laughs> which makes kind of no sense. Steve Carstensen, many of y'all know him. He's a general dentist that really pretty much specializes in dental sleep medicine. And he's going to talk about screening. Jerry Simmons and myself, and I know Nicole and some others are on the American Dental Association's Children's Airway Screener Task Force. We're going to kind of bring that up. But how do you screen for these things? And Steve's going to go into that a little bit. Like I said, Jerry Simmons will talk about maybe the thing that we're doing for the ADA and the screening, which I think we got a worldwide audience here, even though a lot of this may be geared toward USA, but it applies everywhere throughout the whole world. I'm going to give a chapter on 3D facial biomarkers. This is something that David Gazal and I and David McIntosh and I've kind of talked about that. There are signs on the face. There are biomarkers on the face that tend to relate to. I mean, you can tell if a kid when they walk in the office and look at their face and you can just tell it right off the bat. Well, we've got a 3D MD camera that does the face in 3D, not just the cone beam. But there are certain facial features that relate to that. The allergic shiners, the narrow nose. There's a lot of things that you could maybe put these things in schools and help you screen for these things. And that's I think that's something. David Gazal has been working on some other biomarkers, urine-based and blood-based and saliva-based or whatever biomarkers that hopefully will be coming out in the future too that'll help us screen for these things and maybe even help diagnose on these. He may talk about that a little bit later. But then we're going to talk about Karen Davidson. Dr. Davidson is going to talk about nasal resistance and kind of measuring objective measurements. It's interesting. She, Dr. Klaus Vott in Germany, invented four-phase rhinomanometry. Now, guess who he went and visited many years ago? He went and visited Christian Gimeno at Stanford, and he brought this thing. And Christian Gimeno was blown away with this. Stanford and UOP are starting back on this again, which will be interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how that kind of works out. I think we've got it. But anyway, Dr. Vaught's still alive, by the way. He's 87 years old. Then we're going to get into the pediatric side. That'll kind of be where David Gazal will will do his magic and David McIntosh can talk about the pediatric ENT stuff that goes on. And then we're going to get into surgery. And that will be a couple of people that will be involved with that. Of course, Stanley Liu, he's the head of otolaryngology at Stanford, took over Dr. Gimeno's basic position. But Dr. Jay Gupta, Rishi Gupta and Thad Conley, at I think it's Stanford and UCSF. The three of them are going to do a chapter on pediatric sleep surgery. 
And then Audrey Yoon, many of y'all know her. She's double board certified in orthodontics and pediatric dentistry. And she's going to talk about surgery first and the dome, the maxillary expansion of these kids early and what they've done, which has been very interesting. We've got a whole chapter on the transverse deficiency of the maxilla. And that's going to be, there's a chapter in there by Dr. Eric Thuler, who's at University of Pennsylvania, my old alma mater for orthodontics. But he's an ENT in Philadelphia. And he and Stanley Liu are actually doing a chapter on the surgical treatment of maxillary deficiency, which is a whole part of this whole thing. Rishi Mohavid, Movahead, and Pat McBride are going to do a whole other chapter on surgery, but theirs is going to be more geared toward conal resorption and TMJ replacement surgery and how that relates to airway because TMJ degeneration can cause the mandible to go back into the airway. So Dr. Mojave, he actually gets in there and replaces, builds back the vertical dimension of the face with joints that are severely degenerative and how that relates to airway. And then, of course, Nicole and some others are going, they're putting their parts in about myofunctional therapy and how speech pathologies associated with it, how breastfeeding enters into this whole thing of craniofacial development. The radiology part, I've got Danny Tamimi. She is one of the ones at Beam Readers. David Hatcher is, of course, the one that started Beam Readers, and he and I have been a good friends for a long time. But she's going to kind of give the CBC tape side of airway and looking at that from the structural standpoint. And then we've got, even I've got some standardization, the standards committee for accreditation and thing. And we say, well, what's that got to do with this? But if you're going to use cone beam and some of these imaging, you need to know that it's kind of accredited because we got to get paid for all this stuff at some point in time. So I've got a whole section on insurance that we're kind of delving into too, because people got to get paid for doing some of this. Artificial intelligence. I've got a Dr. John Mark Retrave, who used to be chairman at Kansas City Ortho, but I think he's out now doing some other things. He's really the expert on artificial intelligence in dentistry and orthodontics. He's going to bring that about dynamic modeling and things like this that are all part of it. We're getting into early kind of what do you do about it? Once you've screened for them, then what do you do? That's where a number of people, Dr. Kevin Boyd, who's a pediatric dentist, John Hayes is an orthodontist that deals a lot with airway. They're going to talk early on about kind of how all this stuff started, maybe, how the Industrial Revolution changed things. And just a few hundred years ago, if you look back at school, not millions of years ago, but I mean, just a few hundred years ago, we had very little malocclusion. And that's what got my attention about these monkey studies. They stopped up their noses and created malocclusion in a set of animals that don't get it. So there's got to be some kind of airway relations. That's what kind of got my attention early on. So they're going to talk about that. Audrey Yoon, again, is going to get into the maxillary expansion, how that occurs and mandibular advancement in these young kids. I mean, she's seeing them now at three years of age which is kind of unheard of in the orthodontic community. But that's kind of when I'm starting to see some of this, is that's where it needs to be recognized and started to be dealt with. Dwayne Grumman's is an orthodontist that I've known for a long time. He worked directly with Dr. Bob Ricketts way back in the old days. But Dwayne is going to talk a couple of different things about early treatment and growth guidance in these young children and especially the class three patients that have maxillary deficiency, how you get in with early expansion and forward movement of the maxilla like a reverse headgear to get the maxilla growing forward. Because I think that's part of the things that's been going on since the Industrial Revolution is what's happening. Our faces are getting more retruded. And maybe that's the reason we, here's a good study, why are wisdom teeth impacted like they are? It's probably because the whole facial component is starting to recede or impacted wisdom teeth associated with 
macular mandibular growth deficiency. Is that why they show up that way? Could be. It makes sense that the whole maxilla and mandible have not grown forward and not grown wide enough to accommodate all 32 teeth. If you look back just a few hundred years ago, 32 teeth was normal and all lined up. (laughs) One of the other final chapters is going to be on TMJ issues and how that's associated with it. Dwayne Grumman's and I will kind of be doing that chapter. Telemedicine will be talked about. Jerry Simmons there. Then we've got a whole chapter on wearables and nearables, <laughs> the rings and those kind of things. Jerry's doing some stuff with sleep image, and we'll kind of talk about that because that's all part of this whole thing. And then we'll even be talking about allergy and asthma. Probably David McIntosh will be giving a little bit on that. But Linda Gibson Young is a nurse that has a PhD in allergy and asthma, and she's going to be kind of talking about it from the nursing side. So I'm, I'm kind of getting the nurses involved in it. And then Ken Burley is kind of an interesting person. He's a general dentist, but a lawyer. And he and Steve Carstensen have written some books together. And I wanted Ken to do a thing on risk management. Just what do we need to watch for and for as what's dentistry? What do they need to do and what do they need to stay out of? We can't diagnose sleep apnea as a dentist but we have to get a physician to do that. He talks about the risk management side of it and some other things, but that's just kind of general overview of how we're looking at the book to be organized, so to speak. Wow. That is a very detailed, comprehensive book. I think you named what, over 20 chapters, it sounds like. Yeah, there's about there's three editors and 26 co-authors. 26 co-authors. Okay. But some of these are like Stanley Lou and Eric. There's two or three together. Like Audrey Yoon's got two or three. So there's a lot of them that are overlaps, but yeah. These are big name people. This is amazing. Yeah. What's the next step for the book? When do we think it'll be ready? Okay. I got a few little cleanup chapters we got to do. Every I've got kind of most everything up on Dropbox now for David Gazal to start looking at and David McIntosh and us trying to hopefully over the holidays, maybe we'll have some little time to kind of get this. My my goal is if we can get this to Springer Publishing, that's who's going to be doing the book in January, which I'd like to do. It takes them about six or eight months. I think David Gazal has done a number of books with them and he knows kind of how that works. I invited Greg Satoris, who's the publisher, one of the publishers or the guys helping us out with publishing the book through Springer. I don't know if he's on, but hopefully he'll see the recording of this. But anyway, it takes about six or eight months, I think, once we can get all the stuff into them. So as soon as we can get that done, hopefully in January, then we can get it to Springer and then start working on it. And hopefully by mid to late 24 is what my practical I was hoping we could do it a year earlier but we haven't hit those milestones but we're getting there I mean this is years and years in the making so what all three of you separately what do you think what kind of changes do you hope this book will make and what are some of the key points that you want readers to get out of this book what about Dr. McIntosh one of the quotes or people that I quote when I'm asked that is Mother Teresa and basically she said something along the lines of, if you can help one person, then just help that one. And that's my whole reason for being, is that there are so many kids out there that, again, as I said before, they're just not being found, they're not being fixed. And it's mostly because people aren't even looking for this. I think if we were to look at the numbers, this is the most chronic healthcare condition in childhood. And there's a multitude of health practitioners that don't even know what we're talking about. If we can just lift the bar, even just a fraction, that's a whole swathe of kids that we're going to start catching. And then I just hope that will then start to build up a little bit of momentum. And in the process of doing that, we'll have more sentries at the gate looking for these problems and spotting them in the crowd and getting them seen and getting them seen too. That's really my big picture. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Gazal? I would like to see both what I call an inward movement and an outward movement. And what I mean by that is the following. The inward movement is 
I would like to see that professionals of all these venues understand that going alone is missing something and that working in multidisciplinary teams will achieve much better outcomes than working as a single-handed specialist that believes that only they can really control everything and know everything. There's no such thing in medicine. From my perspective, to serve as a multidisciplinary book is a way of waking as a wake-up call to all those that involved in, in, from their own perspective, in the evaluation and treatment and management of a disease such as the airway disease, of thinking that they can contribute a portion, a very important one. But if they bring along others and work together, they can do a much better job. So that's the inward version. The outward version is one that Dr. McIntosh already alluded to, which is that as we start considering the fact that we need to implement programs that both detect and treat children or young adults or developing adolescents, that we need to start of thinking this as a lifelong disease and one that merits a very early intervention and then a very sustained follow-up in order to optimize the way that we deliver care to our patients. And then by doing so, we need to increase awareness at the level of parents, at the level of primary care physicians. And it's not just physicians, it's primary care dentists, it's primary care myofunctional therapists, it's primary care speech therapists, it's primary care orthodontists, it's primary care every specialty. And anybody involved in healthcare needs to start thinking of the fact that an array of symptoms that they may perceive as being related to their specialty could also be applicable to other specialists or to other people that know a little different perspective and therefore alert the patient. Look, I'm going to give an example. The first time when I started treating sleep apnea many, many years ago, it was 1981. I knew very little about sleep at the time. I loved sleep, but I was involved in sudden infant death syndrome and apnea of of infancy, which has nothing to do with sleep apnea. And yet, parents brought me kids that had very large tonsils. And they said, you know, they stopped breathing at night, and I did sleep studies, and I saw what they had, and they had very severe apnea. But one thing that marked me, and I said, ah, it's parents lying and telling me just because they had surgery and my ENT colleagues were taking the tonsils out, You know, doctor, suddenly our kids are different people. They have changed. They were either not doing well in school or they were behaving very badly or they were being grumpy in the morning and they're rarely happy and they were getting into trouble with other kids. And now they've done the surgery. They're different kids. And I said, well, you know, that's something that we all attribute to the placebo effect. Parents wanting to see the best in their kids. But you keep getting this story over and over and over. And wow. So I went to the literature, and lo and behold, 1976, Christian gave me no six kids. In the paper, he describes their, and they had the same behavioral issues. I said, well, now it's a little bit more than this, right? The point that I'm making is the ha-ha moments that Bill wanted to bring to the book are a way of making sure that both at the parents' levels, at the society levels, at the primary care levels, at the primary dentistry levels, at the primary everything level, we have and induce aha moments that resonate with everybody in order to make sure that we become an educated community that understands that a lifelong disease with vulnerabilities can be very adequately managed if we all invest into it and put this at the center, at the cardinal center, put the child well-being as the primary goal for everything that we do. And I think that if we start with that, we will have achieved a great deal. And by doing so, you know, I called it the ripple effect of a book. You throw a stone, you take a book, throw it in the middle of a lake, and For the heck of it, all it does is to create a little wave that will propagate throughout the whole lake 
at least we have caught the attention of everybody. And if we can do that with this book, it will be quite a major accomplishment. That is right on. And it's so interesting, too, because a lot of people who have these aha moments, should they really be aha moments? It's usually the caregiver or the person themselves reflecting back on great difficulty with themselves or a family member and all of a sudden realizing, oh, my goodness, all these problems I had or my child had was a sleep related breathing disorder. Should it be this way or should it be pediatrician recognizes we see this in early childhood and whenever this begins to occur and we're able to identify it versus having to reflect back and be like, oh my goodness, that's why we were suffering. I want to ask, I don't know if Dr. Gazal can talk about this, but the biomarkers sound very interesting and important as ways to maybe avoid aha moments and detect these problems as they're beginning to develop. Are you able to talk at all about the urine, blood, or saliva biomarker research that you're doing? Of course. But let me first define the biomarker, because as Dr. Harrell already alluded to, a biomarker is, is an element that exists in our, whether it's any feature that of our body, whether it's uh, fluids or face or some measure that comes from our body that can be used as a reliable predictor of either a disease or a consequence of disease of a response to therapy. So those are, in general terms, what we define biomarkers. So it can be a pulse oximeter that is put into a kid and gives us a result, or it can be a three-dimensional picture of a kid, or a set of symptoms, okay, a cluster of symptoms that when put together and if screened together can give you a biomarker of risk of disease. It doesn't need to be necessarily a blood test or a saliva test or a urine test and so on. Our assumption for a long time was that we do not do very adequate phenotyping of all the consequences of sleep disorder breathing in children. And because of that, because of what it would take to measure IQ and behavior and cognition and cognitive, subtle cognitive functions, and then cardiovascular function in children that otherwise would be normal. There might be some subtle elements that are very difficult to detect, and metabolic components and many others, right? The ability to control urine and they respond to urine or sleepiness. It's a very difficult thing to measure. If we were able to collapse all of these into a set of biomarkers that would allow us to then take a picture of a kid and says, oh, you're at risk. Okay, I don't know if you have sleep apnea or not, but at least you are defined in a group that may be at risk. And so you deserve to be evaluated a little bit more thoroughly. Or you have a metric, you know, the same way that you come and get your cholesterol. Well, let me see your sleep disorder breathing all measure. That was the idea. The fact that sleep disorder breathing and all its components affects a lot of our systems in the body means that there's a lot of genes and a lot of those genes translate into proteins and to products, into microbiome, into a variety of other things, saliva changes and so on, that we can measure. And if we find those, they will give us an idea about whether you have disease, at least at risk of disease. They will give you as an idea whether it's affecting you as an individual, what consequences you may have. And if we treat you, are you responding properly to the treatment, yes or no? With that, there's been a lot of work that has been done over the last 20 years or so, trying to identify all these. And today, with machine learning, with deep learning elements, with artificial intelligence, with collecting both a variety of demographic data, photography data, biological measures, etc., we can construct wonderful multiplexed panels that if we use them in the context of primary care or in the, use this in the context of coordinated work, might are going to help us detect not only the unique clusters of those, for example, that, okay, I have a child in my clinic. He has panel A versus panel B versus panel C profile. And now imagine that panel A, if I treat you with just taking the tonsils out, you're going to be fine. You, we don't need to do anything else. In principle, 99% and 95% will do just fine. Well, that's great. But there might be a group, panel C, that we're going to treat you with the same treatment, which is what we do, but it's only a 30% probability of actually doing well. Now, 30% is not bad. We still want to give those 30%, but 
But I want to know who the 70% are that did not do as well as I would like in order to continue the management. So these are the things that will guide us. And then, okay, well, this group, panel C, is C1, C2, and C3. If I do treatment B, number two, the treatment C1 will do better. But if I do another treatment, C2 will do much better by choosing this. So if I can detect those, then I can use that to personalize therapy in ways that were not possible 10 years ago or five years ago. That's where we're going with medicine. That's where we're going with care. That's where we're going with sleep disorder breathing. And we need to be as precise as possible in order to optimize the outcomes. At the end, it's all about making sure that we treat every patient as if it's the only one and go back to Mother Teresa and Dr. McIntosh. <laughs> if you can do make one person happy, start with that person, and then we'll keep going to the next one. Domino effect, or the ripple effect, right? Absolutely. Dr. McIntosh, what do you feel is like a fallacy in terms of your field of study, so ENT, with regard to airway and sleep breathing that a lot of people have believed to be true. What are you finding? That's not correct and people might need to know. And it'd be great for all of you in your different fields like pediatrics and orthodontists, something sort of setting the record straight or helping clarify. Sure. So I guess the first thing is the misunderstanding of the role of tonsil surgery. The primary indication, so indication means the reason that we do things, the primary, so the number one reason that we remove tonsils in children is because they are too big. A history of tonsillitis is completely irrelevant. When I have medical students come through, I say, look, ENT is actually really easy. First of all, it's very easy to spell. Putting it on the application form was a piece of cake. But there's basically only two main reasons that we do things, obstruction or infection. That's 80% of what we do, regardless of what it is that we do and what it is that we're fixing. That's 80% of our go-to falls into that category of infection or obstruction. And when it comes to tonsils, 80 to 90% of it is about obstruction and 10 to 20% of it is about infection. So that'd be the first thing. The second thing would be probably the age, the suggestion that they're too young to get fixed. My counter to that is they're too young to have a problem. And we know from the huge amount of science out there that one of the determining factors on the outcome of this child in terms of their growth and development and well-being is the age of onset of the disease. And the younger it starts as a group, the worse they do. The second dynamic is the duration of the disease. We know that once they hit about six months of disease time, then moving forwards from there, they're the ones that respond less so to interventions and treatments such as tonsil and adenoid surgery. Basically, there is a time critical element where the paradigm of letting them outgrow it really needs to be put into the, we made a mistake in history in advocating a strategy. This may obviously change in time because we just don't have the sophisticated tools. And that's where the biomarkers may actually play out to our advantage, for example. They may select out the kids and say, you know what, these kids actually are the ones that are probably going to be okay if we leave them alone. But the rest of you all, you'll just go and get things fixed. And then the last thing would be exactly what David Gazal has said, is the thought process that all we need to do in all of these kids is take out their tonsils and adenoids and that'll fix all of them and that'll fix them forever. And that's simply not true. Yeah, those are all really great points. What about Dr. Harrell, Dr. Gazal, in terms of your fields like orthodontics, pediatrics, pulmonology, what's something that you feel people have believed to be true about sleep medicine and airway, but it's actually not, it's more of a myth. I think that the major fallacy that exists is that one, the recovery is guaranteed when you treat the disease, first thing. I will first start with a principle that I learned during my first year of medicine now uh, 50 years ago, and that was from the, my first professor in medicine who said, gentlemen and ladies, this is the way it started on purpose to catch our attention, rather than ladies and gentlemen, which was immediately, oh, really? Well... In medicine and in love, never, never, never always. So the first thing is important is that when you treat a condition, doesn't matter which one, 
to assume that everybody will completely restore back to being what they were at their full potential is a fallacy. You all know that even a car, when you take him to the mechanic and you have to change a piece, it's not the same as what it was before you changed the piece and the car was new. It's never the same. Why would you expect that somebody with sustained damage from a disease will be able to completely recover to 100% of their actual what they were before? So that's first. And as Dr. McIntosh alluded to, the duration and severity are going to be major determinants of whether the recovery can be no, 99%, 98%, 90%, 70%, or no recovery at all. So that's the first fallacy. The second point that I think is very important to start thinking of is uh, to assume that everybody is going to develop the same range of complications. And we all know that it is not the case, okay? Oh, well, if they don't show this and this and this, then it means that the disease is not there. This is absolutely not true. So the concept that some people are extremely sensitive and others are less sensitive by a variety of genes and environment in which they live, the way they live and the way that they were born with whatever genes that they carry and variances that they carry needs to be incorporated and still we still don't know very well how to do it. And the third element is that sleep is like a simple bank account. Well, sleep is probably a bank account and when you count off the amount of sleep, the less you sleep or the more you restrict your sleep, you're going to be more likely to suffer from a particular consequence. But the recovery from the sleep, the poor quality sleep, usually you need to remember, and there's a fallacy, it does not take the same amount of sleep to recover from the sleep that you lost. It may take much more and longer periods of time of recovery. Again, you treat somebody, don't expect them to within six weeks or two months or one month to be fully recovered because that may take a very, very long time depending on how long it took for them to show up. And that, what we call hysteresis of the recovery, which is how the dynamics of the recovery differ from the dynamics of the damage, is a very important element that most people don't, don't understand. And I think that when you take all these three together, then we're all living in la-la land, that everything that we do is going to be just fine. And we all know that la-la land only exists in the movies. And the movie was great, but I'd rather live in real land. And real land means that we need to work together. That's true. And we're anxiously awaiting those person-specific probiotics that should be out within the next two years to help us with full recovery, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Tomorrow, the, no, just kidding. <laughs> Watch the Airway Circle interview with Dr. Gazal about microbiome probiotics. Very interesting. But what about you, Dr. Harrell, in terms of an orthodontic fallacy? Yeah, forever. And if you go talk to lay people or even dentists or whatever, I mean, Orthodontics kind of started out as, hey, we're straightening teeth and making them look pretty, and it's the aesthetic quality, and we can get into all these micro things that we're looking at. But what we found is really, and you have to understand orthodontic education a little bit of why it's like it is, and I can talk about it because I am a orthodontic. The residents are there for three years, and this is, I teach at UAB and run into the kind of the same thing. For them to try to see early on is not practical in the orthodontic educational system. They're there for three years to learn how to move teeth. Well, how has the whole thing evolved? We don't want to see them until all their permanent teeth come in because we can't move the teeth till they're there. The whole educational process has been less wait, less watchfully wait these kids if they've got a crossbite or some kind of asymmetry or something like that, we might go in and do some things at six, seven, eight. But a lot of those are just going to be, okay, we look, we go, let's recall them six months. Let's recall them six months. Let's recall them six months till all the permanent teeth are up. And then guess what? Crooked teeth is not a problem of the teeth. It's the foundation. It's like trying to put a four-bedroom house on a two-bedroom foundation, or it's like trying to put a size 11 foot and a size 8 shoe. And this is the way I explain it. The way we've been doing this is we've been taking the size 11 foot, we've been cutting the toes off and make it fit the shoe. 
because we've been waiting too long to be able to make the shoe bigger, so to speak, because we're letting all the boundary conditions formulate themselves. But it's like a child that's got club feet. When are you going to treat them? One week, one day, the next day or whatever. You're not going to wait very long until you put braces on their feet and mold them around. So by the time they're walking, they can walk. By the time they want to start running, they can run. But if you wait (laughs) and let those feet develop, then you've got a major problem and they'll never be the same. That's kind of the thing I look at. And one thing I try to bring when the, the residents is, here's a three-year-old that's got some problems and already starting to show signs and symptoms. What do you do? Maybe it's expansion. Maybe it's growth guidance or whatever. But one of the things I try to explain to orthodontists is, what is one of the treatments or almost cures for sleep apnea in an adult? It's double jaw surgery. Just about, I mean, it's the closest thing we got. What are we doing in double jaw surgery? We're bringing them forward and we're widening everything out and bringing the mandible forward. What are we doing? We're opening up the airway. Why don't we have that same thought process in these young kids? But we can do it growth guidance wise and not surgically. And I'm not going to get into the discussion about extraction, non extraction. I can tell you, I haven't extracted bicuspids in so long because I treat them early and I make the room that I need. But there is some risk factors there. If you start, it just makes sense. If you've got a smaller shoe and you got a bigger foot, you got to do one of two things. You got to make the foot smaller or you got to make the shoe bigger. What's the most obvious thing? Make the shoe bigger. When is it easier to make the shoe bigger while they're still growing? rapidly. And the earlier you can do that, the better. If you're an orthodontist that just says, I'm not going to see, it's a challenge for me to see a three, four, five, six, year, five year old, because I'm not really trained <laughs> in the management of that young. I get them now, but I have to look and say, can they sit still enough for me to examine them? Can they sit still enough for me to do an x-ray on them or something? And then are they going to be able to wear something, whether it's removable or fixed or whatever, at that age group? But now you start getting into maybe the six, seven, eight-year-olds, which are easier to treat because you got a little bit more control over those. Again, you're getting into expansion and mandibular advancement from a growth guidance standpoint, which helps. you got people that have adenoids and tonsil issues. Some of those you operate on, maybe they don't get better because the structure has not been taken care of. Those are the things I wish orthodontists would kind of open their mind up a little bit more to. The training that you get in the school is one thing. You can't fault the system. That's just the way it is. But they've got to learn how to move teeth before they get out and practice on real patients. But then just go and learn as much as you can about early treatment and airway and TMJ and all these other things that you may not get as good an educational information on because it does make a difference. I mean, airways related. I've actually got an article that I'm doing for Steve Carstensen in the Dental Sleep Practice Journal. It's supposed to come out, I think, in spring. But it's called the Breathing Smile Connection, the intersection of orthodontics with airway. And what it basically talks about is that we orthodontists have been focused so much on smile aesthetics and all this, but we got to put breathing into the formula. We've got to look at that. We want to make the teeth look good and all that. That's what I think the thing that the lay people, what do they normally bring their child in for? They got crooked teeth or they got a malformed jaw or something. They usually bring them in later because that's just 12 or 14 is kind of the orthodontic age. And that's just, how it's evolved over time. And then the parents are thinking, well, you know, I just want to straighten them out, make them look good, make them be beautiful. So they later get married, all that kind of stuff. But it's more than that. It's the health of that child over time. And that's where I think both Davids have really pioneered the way through this. And that's kind of why I wanted to get, the book is heavily kind of geared toward the medical side And there's a purpose for that. And the title, if you look at the title, 
growing into breathing problems. That's the pediatric part. The quest for collaborative lifetime solutions, like David Gazal just said, this is lifetime solutions is the adult side. So I was trying to come up with a title that didn't say pediatric and didn't say adult, but subliminally, I guess, gave that. So that's kind of where it came up kind of with the title of it. Yeah, I think that's great. And it reminds me how you're saying we don't want to be focused on just straining teeth, but think about the jaws, the bones, and the bones and the structure of the airway. And Dr. Derek Mahoney, the orthodontist, said when we have a child with crowded teeth and we're just putting braces and straightening the teeth, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. I never forget that. I just think, wow, that's a... Visual. So I have one last question because I want to honor all of your time and I know we're just done right now, but I want to ask one thing. If you could gift this book to any field of practitioners, pediatricians, dentists, ENT, whatever, or even parents, and the whole field would read this book and understand it, who would you gift this book to? I'll go first, school teachers. Oh, surprising. I didn't think you would say that. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Of course, it is a kind of a medical textbook side of it, but I want, of course, my orthodontic profession to to look at this because I think we're just kind of missing the boat, the potential that is there that we know how to do. We just kind of got to do it earlier. I hope the book explains that and kind of brings that to a point. Mm -hmm. Great. How about you, Dr. Gazelle? I would give it to health reporters. Ooh. Mm -hmm. I think we need to create a dispersion that transcends the professional so that there is a coalition of the public and the medical field or the healthcare field in order to bring together. And for that, I would call that that we need to bring it to the TikTok influencers that really are able to explain in terms that everybody understands and appreciates what we, by virtue of our technocratic bias, tend to explain in terms that are usually very, very difficult to understand. We were never trained on how to do two things, at least in my training. One was how to manage a business, never learned how to do it. And two, I to talk to people about what we do tell our stories. And those are two things that I think to the component of the business is not that relevant, but I think the how to tell the story needs to be done by the reporters, those that are the new ways of doing journalism and to the public and to everybody else. And if we can bring that message in the right way to everybody, in ways that people will digest, understand, and then take it from there, then we have gained everything without necessarily saying a single word about what we do and how we do it. Absolutely. And I'm going to use that as an advertising point there, guys. If anybody knows Joe Rogan, Andrew Humerman, Peter Atia, or Rhonda Patrick, tap them on the shoulder. We want to talk. They've got a huge audience. One A-list celebrity that has a touch point with this conversation. Bring Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi and let them talk about the airway, and we will have billions of people. Get Oprah. You got to get Oprah. I'm not joking. If we bring influencers to the field and they have kids, and therefore if we talk to them through their kids, and they are willing to engage in simply saying that this book or whatever we're trying to do, which is to bring respite to children that deserve better, that will do marvels for everybody in the field, and more importantly, We'll do exactly what we're aiming to do, which is to take care of the kids and make them happy. Happy kids. Happy kids in life. Yeah, Yeah. that is so true. And we won't be speaking to maybe many closed off professionals, but the public who are feeling it, hearing it, open to hearing it. Okay, Renata, that's your next project. You're on it. Yep. I'm on it. I got it. I I touched Ronaldo. She's from Brazil. And so Lionel Messi may have a problem with her. Yes, yes, yes. my sister. But but let me tell you, Renata, let me tell you, since you are from Brazil and Brazilians are avid football players and lovers, and my father was from Argentina, but I grew up in Portugal. So we can bring Messi and Ronaldo together. 
with Jairzinho, with somebody else. And now we have a full... <laughs> I'm totally okay with that. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> and we're going to bend it like Beckham and that's yes. it. We're done. Yes. <laughs> that will be a dream. No, I actually know some famous soccer players. I've spoken right. to Pato before, Ronaldinho yeah. Gaucho. I've been to his house. So maybe I can make some phone calls. <laughs> yeah, hold on. <laughs> this is wonderful. Thing. Thank you guys so much for taking time to come chat with us. Sorry, I got my little one here. I don't know if you can hear Benny. I cannot wait for this book to come out. Do we have a date yet, Dr. Harrell? It's probably going to be mid to late 24. As soon as the editors can get all the stuff in and get it to them, hopefully get it to Springer just as soon as we can. As soon as we can get it to them, it's going to be about six, or eight months, I think, in the time frame. But Look forward at the end of 24. We'll be practical about it that way. The sooner well, the better, can't... though. Gathering those teams of people. Let's try to get this It's out. like herding yeah. cats. I'll be real honest with you. Uh, and <laughs> some people... Most of them already in, but there's a few little stragglers out there that we're trying and some to people find. write too much and then you cut them off. And Yeah. Like... Oh, who would that be? No, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> Who in this year? But yeah, thank you guys so much for all your time. I know you guys are so busy. So I really appreciate you taking over an hour out of your busy week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Happy Happy holidays. Enjoy everyone. To families and to everybody. And see you next year very soon. And with a lot of happiness and success for everybody. Absolutely. 100%. Thank you, everyone. And the more successful we are, the more kids we help. So it's a win win situation. (laughs) Everyone, thank you so much. (laughs) Bye. Have a wonderful day. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to our radio style broadcast, where we bring different perspectives to the airway world in an easily digestible format. Different hosts, different views, same airway talk. Don't forget to leave us a review. Bye bye.